you know, I'm tired of being asked if I'm a robot or not. I'm I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech, the three o'clock block uh, with Think Tech Tech Talks uh, with Attila Ceres of uh, Silanda. Uh, welcome to the show. Nice to see your smiling face, Attila. Hey, always glad to be here. And if I can be as cool as you with your glasses, I'm going to I'm going to join in with uh, with a little bit of coolness, too. So thanks for yeah, having me. We're doing cool here. So let's start out with the title, you know, about robots. I'm really interested in that because I've been hung up on robots many times. And I want to hear, you know, why they started and who operates them and sells them and how, you know, nefarious people have gotten into the robot game. Can you talk about it? Well, sure. But in order to do that, I'm going to have to take off my glasses to be a little bit more serious. I hope you don't mind. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I don't know about you, but every time I take my laptop somewhere new and I try to log into, you know, banking or financial institution website or whatever, I'm being asked, am I a robot? Am I a robot? It kind of drives you crazy because it's because your IP address has changed. You're like a new entity. And they want to validate that you are a real person, right? And this is called CAPTCHA, C-A-P-T-C-H-A. And there's a, there's a few ways that CAPTCHA works. You can have fuzzy letters. You can be asked to do... Uh, numerical math problems you can uh, figure out uh, like my the one that drives my kids crazy is roblox and roblox has an insane capture mechanism where you have to like pick the matching shapes of like a six-sided uh dice and it's and it's just you know irritating and no one likes it it's uh it's terrible so um one of the uh the the biggest boys on this block is uh google and they've Put out a uh, an API that allows you to make a call and generate a captcha on your on your website. That's going to have, uh, for example, ask you for uh, which boxes have stoplights or which boxes have a crosswalk or which boxes on this uh, on the series of pictures has a motorcycle. That kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And and if you answer correctly, then you know you can proceed into the website. Now, uh, why this new uh, scam is a little bit different is because they're Taking that same mechanism, that same CAPTCHA mechanism, and uh, they're adding a sense of legitimacy to websites that are trying to harvest your information. So here's how it goes. A text message or instant message or an email comes in, uh, perhaps on your phone, and notifies you and says, hey, you know, you, you need to uh, update your information. Uh, uh, one, one scan they're working on now, uh, or should I say one scan they're working on alerting the public to right now. I'm is glad about, you changed the way you phrased that. Yeah, <laughs> it's important. <laughs> uh, but yeah, we, we try to like get these, these kind of critical time sensitive scams out as fast as possible. But uh, unfortunately, if we dump them all out at one time, then everyone gets uh, overwhelmed. So we try to slowly feed them out and curate them so that uh, you know, folks can actually do something about them. There's a new one going on uh, about uh, drive, expired driver's license scams, right? So those those uh, messages come in through instant messages saying, hey, that your driver's license is expired. You need to click here uh, to go to this website, right? And at this website, we're going to ask for your information. But before it allows you in to harvest your information or to harvest your credentials, ask for that CAPTCHA. And most people, when they see that, they're like, oh, this is a legitimate site. They want to verify that I'm a real person and that I'm not, you know, out there doing bad things. And uh, so it, that, that kind of gives it this sense of legitimacy. Now, CAPTCHA is kind of nefarious in, in that um, not only does it give that sense of credibility, but it also shields the affected website from probes that can go in there and perhaps siphon out uh, a file that could be infected and detect that site. And uh, it also prevents, uh, you know, just web crawling in general. So uh, a lot of these sites, they're very difficult to find for that reason. Uh, last month alone, uh, according to one security firm, they found over 500 new sites per day being created with this fake uh, CAPTCHA, uh, image CAPTCHA um, uh, scam. And uh, so obviously this is not a new scam. This has come up before, but the extent to which we're seeing this now is new. Huh. So it, it's not so much that the CAPTCHA function actually does bad things to you it's only that it it lends credibility to a site that is um that is a false a phony site is that is that what it is exactly exactly so just because you see that captcha on a on a link 
clicked on doesn't necessarily mean that it's safe to safe to use. Well, you know, the thing about the capture, a legitimate capture now, is that it'll have something on the bottom that says, if you can't read um, the, you know, the boxes that have the traffic lights or the stop signs or the bicycles or the crosswalks, uh, press here and we'll send it to you in some other way. We'll, we'll verify with you in some other way. And you say to yourself, that's pretty sophisticated. Um, that you know they recognize that I may not be able to deal very easily for whatever my handicap might be um, with the pictures at the traffic lights or the crosswalks and the like, and they'll play a sound, or they'll play those cockamamie numbers, and I'm supposed to read numbers. That's wor that's worse than I go to when I go to the ophthalmologist and try to read the art the eye chart. Uh, I have trouble enough with the eye chart. I have more trouble with the cockamamie numbers that are upside down and backward and you know, reflective and so forth. But, you know, it seems to me that when Google does it, and I'll, I'll assume that the ones I'm talking about are Google, um, it's pretty sophisticated, uh, where um, if you can't do it one way, they'll present another way. And so you can verify it any three or four different kinds of ways. And then you should have some confidence in that, right? Well, the, the idea is that there are legitimate CAPTCHA, you know, companies that create a CAPTCHA product. And anyone can use them, right? To validate someone on their existing website. If it's, uh, you know, it doesn't matter whether it's whether or not it's a legitimate site or not. Um, and the the issue is here that there are so many tens of thousands of these sites being created that it's difficult for them to really vet out the ones that are malicious. Uh, the way they've been able to find some of these is uh, API key reuse. So what that means is that the the key, the token, the authentication token that's being used to generate the captcha is being used on a website that's requesting users input their Office 365 password and their Apple ID, right? So they can see right away, oh, look, we have a reuse here. So there, there's a little bit of laziness on the hacker side, um, but I, I would definitely not uh, say that this is gonna go away anytime soon. Uh, just be aware that they try to lend credibility any way they can. How, fact, how, how, uh, what, how can I tell a phony capture from a real one? look at the URL. That's the easiest place to start. And they're getting really sophisticated now. Uh, the folks that we're talking to now, particularly in financial services and in government contracting, uh, they are being fished heavily with uh, highly customized domains that, that are exact duplicates of uh, even some federal and state websites. Uh, there are some DMV websites that are, uh, that are out there that, I mean, are a perfect match uh, so far, we haven't seen them in Hawaii. They've been more in the Midwest, so like Minnesota, Illinois, those kind of Michigan, those kind of places. They've been uh, subject to uh, to these kind of uh, DMV attacks. How can but, I get a perfect match on a domain name? Is, you know that that sounds like it's um, structurally impossible. How do they do that? Well, think about it this way. Let's say I want to register a domain name that no one's used before. Let's say that domain name is uh, XYZ two thousand three. <laughs> right. So let's say I want to create a Microsoft phishing web page. Then I could say uh, I could create a domain prefix www.microsoft.com.xyz2003.com. And most people will just read the beginning of that and not follow through all the way to the end. So that domain prefix, that www or the secure or the, you know, I could call it jfidel.thinktech.com. That domain prefix, that, that's where they're able to really make the difference. I wouldn't and, know the difference. If, if you sent me something that said www, Microsoft, mm, whatever, and some kind of, you know, name of an organization or, um, you know, a business group uh, that, that was exactly the same as the one that I'm familiar with, I couldn't tell the difference. As a matter of fact, if they could slip the word Microsoft in there, even though it's not legit in that domain name and that return address, um, that would lend credibility if they did that. How in the world would I know it wasn't legit? Well, that's where it comes to security awareness training. I mean, uh, the human firewall is ultimately your best effort. I mean, that is your best bet. So if you can really get that human firewall figured out, um, 
Yeah. And, uh, you know, we can figure it out from there. Uh, that's how security awareness training is so important. Well, you know, I always look at the return address of email that sounds fishy, F fishy, not fishing, fishy, fishing. Uh, I always look at the return, always. Um, but I'll tell you the truth, if it had a, you know, if it had the name of a legitimate tech company in there, I wouldn't, I wouldn't really be, I would buy, I would buy into that. But let, let's, you know, let's talk about, uh, you know, phishing in general these days. It seems to me that they're always trying to, and I got a call this morning from, a, a, it was a recorded call and it said, this is the social social uh, social security administration calling and there's been a breach on your social security number. Uh, so if you do something, you know, it'll connect you with somebody who's gonna help you clear up your social security number breach. And, and I said, well, no, that's a funny way to do it because the very first question that person is gonna ask me or that automated you know, telephone message is gonna ask me is what is your social security number? And I said, well, don't they tell you not to give your social security number out to anybody? So, you know, you know they're gonna ask that question and you know it's pretty strange that they're calling you like this. So, you know, I feel that you always have to be on your toes. That's a complete phony. And you've seen that ad, this kid is at his computer and his mother is, you know, making dinner or something. And he, and he turns to his mother and he says, mom, you know, what's the password on your 401k account? It's a great ad. <laughs> and his mother, his mother says, what? <laughs> what did you say? <laughs> but I think that happens. It does happen, doesn't it? <laughs> well, you know, password reuse is a big problem. Uh, that that's uh, you know that's part of credential harvesting is that they, if they are able to obtain a username and password, and then reuse that username and password on your bank account or uh, you know social media accounts, etc., that that's where you kind of run into some trouble. So if you do have to reuse the same password, and by the way, most people use the same password on more than one account. So let, let's just be real here. Not not me and not you, Attila. Right. Well, it's because we're pretty diligent about it, and you know that this is our profession. But most people don't. So the uh, the way to to you know to do that is to at least turn on two factor authentication for every web service that you can. So that way, if someone does try to log in from a foreign country into your Gmail account, boom, they're going to be prompted with an authentication method. It's going to show up on your phone, and you can deny them. Right? Uh, you well, don't is want... there a way to crack that? Is there a way to crack? two-factor authentication? There are starting to become ways, yes. And uh, you know, if, if you go back to the T-Mobile data breach that just recently occurred, uh, I'm sure you've heard about it where it was millions and millions of customer accounts, IMEI numbers, geolocation, uh, some credit card numbers, social securities, that kind of stuff was leaked out from T-Mobile, which by the way, I, I know they're saying that they're taking uh, security seriously. We'll, we'll wait and see. I mean, this is their third breach, I think in three years or four years. So um, for T-Mobile, you know, for T-Mobile, for T-Mobile, yeah. And this this doesn't necessarily mean uh, you know active accounts. This is anyone who's been a T-Mobile customer who has applied to be a T-Mobile customer. So there's some of that there. Yeah, well, I, you know, it's a, it's an ongoing problem. But you know, there's a a, a number of password protection um, software programs, apps available for your phone, for your computer, and good news, they talk to each other as so you put it in on your phone and it comes up on your computer and it's supposed to be safe. But I, and I really wonder about how safe it might be because uh, if they, you know, because if I was a hacker, I'd really try to crack that program. That would be a bonanza for me if I could do that. Can you do that? Are people doing that? Absolutely, yeah. So that's a supply chain attack. And, uh, you know, the only defense you're going to have against that is some sort of mobile device monitoring. Uh, we do quite a lot of that. Uh, it's called MDM. Uh, and there's different levels of mobile device security that you should be aware of. So uh, first is like a non-intrusive layer, uh, something where you can go and look at uh, websites, whatever you want. But if one of those ad networks on one of those websites, like let's say you go to people.com, that ad network is infected, 
and it tries to deliver a malicious code onto your device, it's going to stop that in its tracks, which is nice. Um, and uh, you know, then you get into the more restrictive type of mobile device management, such as uh, geo tracking, uh, text message monitoring, that kind of thing. So uh, most for compliance reasons, unless it's a company supplied phone, you just want to go with a level one uh, type of mobile device management solution. Uh, on a commercial level, it's it it's uh, it, it is readily available, but it is relatively complex. I, I believe there are some consumer grade ones for uh, consumer devices, but I wouldn't consider them as uh, as viable as something as a product that's being watched twenty four seven by a live SOC team. I mean that that's what we have. So wow, it's getting more complicated. It seems like every every time we talk, it's more complicated and more threatening. You know, my wife got an email today. Today, this is all today from some girlfriend of hers. And she called, it was a very bizarre email, but she looked at the sending address and it was the address of her friend, for sure. But was, since it was um, bizarre, she called the woman on the telephone and she said, did you send me this email, which seems bizarre? And the woman said, no, somebody has hacked into my email account. And is sending everybody on my email account these bizarre messages. How do they do that? And how do you stop them from doing that? Well, just like what I described, I mean, having that two-factor authentication on it, uh, I'm assuming this is like a Gmail account or a Yahoo account, uh, turning that on, at least on your personal level, is, is, is a good place to start. Now, think about this. Imagine if this is the HR manager's email. And this is, this is a, a big takeaway. If, so, if anyone has a notepad and they're listening to this and they use Office 365 for their work, know this, Office 365 out of the box, straight from Microsoft, comes insecurely configured. You want to get yourself something called a secure score, a Microsoft secure score, microsoft.com slash secure score. That will show you what the security posture is of your organization. If you don't have two-factor uh, enabled, if you don't have a lot of these uh, places, uh, these holes plugged, then they can get right in there and they can jump not just into you know, a personal email that might go out to, uh, to friends and family. We're talking about employee HR records, money transfer, money theft, intellectual property theft. Uh, they can get inside your cloud accounts, your storage repositories. Uh, if you're handling government contracts with controlled and classified information, then you risk exposing uh, that to the outside world. And, and in that case, you have a breach protocol. Uh, you put yourself at risk for not being uh, uh, up for renewal on those government contracts. Uh, this is some pretty serious stuff, all of which can be avoided. <laughs> for Microsoft's 365 secure score tool that most people don't know about. And that's going to give you a secure score. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. Two-factor two -factor verification, authentication. Um, how does that play into email? I mean, I'm I have the email account on my machine. This other person, my wife's friend, has the email account on her machine, and she's sending me an email. So where does two-factor play in that? Sure. So uh, let's say I, I know that you guys use uh, Google for your uh, for your think tech. Uh, I, I'm not admitting know. anything, except I'm, <laughs> except I want to tell you that everybody I know uses Gmail. I mean, the G Gmail is uh, it's free. Uh, Gmail, uh, and, you know, it has issues, but it's free, and and everyone that you know uses Gmail, don't they? Sure. It's scary and, that, that Google has so much control over our lives. Well, uh, you know, they, they have a lot of information about us, that's for sure. They know you better than you think you do. <laughs> just go on your YouTube feed and you'll find out. But um, so in, let, let's just pretend, because this isn't very hard to figure out. I know Think Tech Hawaii uh, uses uh, Google Apps, right? Or Google Workspace, as it's called now. If I were to know your username and password that was breached perhaps from your Star Advertiser account, and if that username and password combination matches, and I try to log into your account, if you have two-factor authentication enabled, you're going to get a pop-up on your phone that says, hey, someone's trying to log in. Do you want to let them in? And you're going to say, heck no, because that's not me, right? Mm -hmm. If you don't have that enabled, I'm in, I could do whatever I want. I could start emailing guests and, you know, say, hey, this is Jay, you know, I want you to send me $5 because I'm in a Mexican prison <laughs> and I need to get out. You know, the old story, we've all gotten mail like that you know, and we all should be suspicious of that. 
But, you know, sometimes, um, you know, uh, let me say, I want to go on record about this, uh, Attila. Sometimes uh, two-factor authentication is a real royal pain in the royal Ocoli, isn't it? It can be. Uh, so I'll, I'll give you another little tip here. Uh, we use something called Keeper. Keeper is a password manager, but it's also a two-factor authentication tool. So what that means is that once you're authenticated with your Keeper account, it's similar to LastPass and there's you know there's there's other password managers out there but having that two-factor code plopped into your website for you when you're trying to log in gold i love it so much easier so uh having that two-factor inside of a uh, password management tool is, is very useful we roll that out quite a lot for companies because as soon as they see that feature the it department sees that they don't have to deal with this two-factor nonsense they're on board it's a blessing yeah so on, on, on um on phones, you know, um, so phones now have pretty good, the Android, which you sold me on Android years ago, I'm sure you remember, it has to be 10 years ago, um, now has very good uh, fingerprint recognition. <laughs> and so, you know, there's two or three ways you can log in or you can have a, a combination of ways, which actually sounds dangerous, uh, any, any number of ways to log in, but uh, the fingerprint thing, I'm, more and more I'm, I'm coming to the conclusion that is the way of the future because the technology is so good. The, you know, uh, what do you think about the fingerprint thing? What do you think about the facial recognition uh, to allow you in? Well, biometrics has its own challenges. It's been around for a long time, but uh, for those with arthritis or who develop arthritis, uh, not going to work. Uh, for those that... Um, that uh, have wet fingers, <laughs> or after you've washed your fingers, you, you know, wash your hands, uh, which we do a lot of these days, of course, in COVID times, well, uh, not gonna work. And if you have a Band-Aid on your finger, it's also not gonna work. <laughs> so <laughs> but don't cut your But have more than one finger registered on the phone. <laughs> exactly. Uh, I mean, you're a Mac user. I'm sure you saw with your MacBook, uh, it also has biometric unlock. Uh, there's there's a unique uh, approach when it comes to biometric. You can use your your, your uh, fingerprint, or you can also use your password. So that's that's uh, that's not a bad approach, especially when it comes to your mobile devices. Uh, the key though is to have the ability to uh, remote wipe those devices if they are lost or stolen, <clears throat> and uh, to make it so that if they try a few too many times, then the device is wiped on its own. Oh, sure. Uh, so yeah. that, well, that takes me, you say remote wipe, but it takes me to a question, uh, which, which I knew a fellow who, who always said, hey, every six months, uh, and this is for consumers, not companies, consumers, every six months, wipe your machine, start from fresh, keep a record of the software you had on there, a record of the you know, serial numbers or passwords or access codes to get back in, but wipe it, man. There's all kinds of stuff, kinds of little chicken tracks that various, um, you know, exchanges have left on your machine, and you really have to clean it off every now and then for many reasons. Do you agree? No. Hmm. What's your philosophy? <laughs> I mean, what's your philosophy on that? Well, whether you should wipe your machine, I mean, that's that's kind of like saying, well, you know, if you're not sure what you're what you're eating. You should just not eat for a week. Well, come on. Hey, that's not just a bad idea. You know? <laughs> well, there's a thing called fasting. I mean, you can fast a little bit, but, you know, making more permanent changes in your behavior so you can leave a healthier lifestyle makes more sense than, than going, you know, dramatic and, and, uh, and uh, you know, jumping off a cliff in terms of, uh, in terms of your behavior. Same thing for, for your machine. I mean, if you have bad... If you have bad security posture, if you've got cybertosis of your system, uh, maybe it's time to start brushing those teeth, clean up your files. Uh, if you don't have a good inventory of your system uh, in terms of its software, just put some of that aside. I don't think it's realistic to wipe your system every six months. I mean, you can, but uh, you know, I think that's just trying to force you to, to, to get into line with a behavior that you should have already, which is mm -hmm. have good file management, have good cleanup, have good practices. Uh, and, uh, you know, my, my personal favorite are the fingerprints on the screen, that, and that drives me crazy. So, you know. <laughs> well, you, you don't want to wipe it off every six months. Anyway, okay, so, but, but tracking from that, 
you know, there are a number, we all know for years and years, a number of virus protectors, uh, and, and they don't all work the same way. They're not all as good. There are a number of programs that help you manage your files and, you know, delete duplicates and clean up, uh, you know, the space so you have more space, more memory, all that. Um, and, you know, you don't know if they're really invasive, especially if they, you know, if they have Russian names on them, I think you'll be a little especially careful about that. Um, but, but, you know, query, is it worth using that? Is it worth installing that? How risky is it? And which are the ones that you trust to tell it? Well, that, that's, a, that's a great question. So there's a difference between antivirus and EDR. EDR is endpoint detection and response. And antivirus typically works reactively, right? So you go to a website, you download something, you click on a link, whatever. And reactively, it tries to prevent you from continuing or prevent the uh, software from spreading on the network. And antivirus programs have increasingly become less effective because the way that cyber criminals enter networks is no longer a, a simple, you know, executable with a uh, malicious payload inside. It's uh, gaining access through a vulnerability and then sitting there and watching the network and slowly uh, taking things over. Uh, and EDR, Endpoint Detection Response, is a proactive approach. So EDR software, and you're going to see this uh, from everywhere right? today, uh, the consensus is that Sentinel-1 is the top EDR software. It's what we use. But the EDR will go and look for unusual behavior, right? Is there uh, something in the supply chain, which we've seen, by the way, in the supply chain where the actual manufacturer of the software bought a component that does a certain function and that component that they purchased was accidentally infected through the supply chain. And EDR is going to find that. It's going to look for lateral, lateral movement. It's going to look for unusual activity from the employees, such as, for example, uh, keyboardless logins. It's going to look for misconfigurations uh, in the system that could leave it open for vulnerabilities. Uh, so the EDR really is the next uh, evolution in antivirus software. We've been using it for a number of years and paired with a live operating service, a security operations center, such as the pictures behind me. <laughs> Once you pair those two things together, that's when the magic happens because it's not just enough to install some software and, and forget about it. It does need to be monitored much the same way as a, as a security system at a, a professional business would need to be monitored as well. You can't just expect to put it up and, and hope that the alarm scares the burglars away. You, you've got to have some police notification, and, and that's that's very important uh, and critical to making this all work. Yeah, and the chances that you, you you have somebody trying to snoop on your system seem greater all the time. And that's why I want to ask you about one other thing before we close, and that is, you know, we've heard from time to time that um, there are programs and functions that wind up leaving little breadcrumbs on your system, and you're just you know Joe Schmo, the ragman. You know, you have no fancy computer, uh, but, but you have a system which has these breadcrumbs on it. And uh, there might come a time when somebody in a far off land decides that it's time to include you in a nefarious mesh operation where a lot of computers are, you know, strung together and they all cooperate in a, you know, in a sinister plan. Um, and so I, I would like to know whether that kind of thing exists on my computer because that's that's worse than somebody you know it's worse than somebody uh, slowing my machine down or taking my data or holding it ransom it's it's making me a, a party to a much larger more damaging event yeah that, that would be a coordinated attack and without proper monitoring on your individual systems this can happen from mobile devices it can happen from laptops workstations servers, cloud-connected devices, IoT devices. I mean, uh, just think about, you know, I know it's old news, but the target attack, and that came from a temperature monitoring system. It was an IoT device. IoT is the next big holy grail, the next big problem uh, for consumers, and it's a great opportunity for cybercrime because these devices are wide open most of the time. They're pushed out to market with very little consideration for security or they get pushed out and then uh, they discover vulnerabilities afterwards because they're using 
a lot of the same kind of common components. Mm. Uh, for example, OpenSSL just came out with a big vulnerability just uh, yesterday, and it's affecting uh, countless devices across all different industries, everything from NASs to uh, the cameras to, uh, to phones. I mean, it's, it's, it's a problem. IoT and, is, uh, is unlimited. So I guess the question is, are state actors involved? And this goes back to, um, you know, the conversation we had before the show began is, you know, as to whether and to what extent we are already involved in a cyber war and what role the strategy of deterrence plays just in a, a nuclear kind of, you know, a Cold War nuclear deterrence um, uh, environment. Um, are we there now? Well, we've been there for years. I mean, it's it's not very public because uh, you do, you can't physically see it or touch it, uh, but you can see in real time. Go go to real time threat maps. Just Google that. Kaspersky, Fortinet, all the big boys. They all have them going on. They're watching and publishing in real time these attacks that are going back and forth, not just here in Hawaii, but all around the world. And you can watch these real time maps. Um, they're they're fascinating to to watch because it really is cyber warfare at its best. And, and unfortunately, as we also talked about before the show, much the same way that uh, in our, the arms race, uh, the nuclear arms race was, uh, was going full flight uh, during the Cold War, uh, we are in the same kind of circumstance with cyber. Uh, it is just a matter of time before a uh, nation state is discovered for uh, injuring or, or, or killing a human being. And that can be a real problem because then what do we do at that point? Uh, there are uh, I mean, you just just listen to the news. The, the the mention of cyber is coming up more and more in talks with uh, presidential concerns, with uh, state concerns, with uh, foreign policy concerns. Uh, cyber is just getting it's it's kind of a public awareness, even though it's been around for a, for a long time. Kind of like climate change, you know, same kind of idea. Been yeah, around but it gets while. worse. Yeah. Yeah. Am I am I wrong? Am I wrong to associate cyber as you have just described it um, with cyber um, in connection with elections and uh, public public sentiment and social media social media tricks and devices um, to affect public sentiment? Uh, isn't that you know kissing cousin to uh, you know the, the hacking kind of cyber? Well, you know, election manipulation has not, is not, it's, it's something that's been around for, and disinformation uh, has been around for uh, some time, uh, not just, and, and that is, by the way, nation state. And uh, I, I'm not sure I can say which nation, but you can probably Google it and find out for yourself. Uh, but it's been around for some time, not just uh, affecting our country, but elections all around the world for years now. This is not new territory. Uh, for cyber criminals, uh, it's not new territory uh, for you and me, uh, and we're going to see more of it. I guarantee it. This is not going away anytime soon. So, last question before we quit, because you know I could stay with you all afternoon here. Um, you know, can I can I keep up? Can we keep up? Because it's you know it seems that it's a spiral, and gets faster. And it gets more sophisticated, and we are lazy, and we think that old systems will suffice to protect us, and we don't follow, you know, the latest action necessarily. Can we keep up? Well, I'll I'll pose this question to you. You don't have to answer. Uh, do you feel safer now than you did five years ago? No. Not at all. And so if, if that's the case, then you have to do something different. And those systems that are five years old and old ways of doing things, definitely not going to work. You, you got to do some something different. Uh, this is why we protect companies. That's why we're dedicated to that. It's because the world has changed. Uh, luckily, we saw it years ago when it was, it was still manageable. And uh, we really got a head start and decided to focus strictly on cyber. And uh, the world needs us now more than ever. I'll vouch for that. Thank you very much, Attila. It's always it's always great to talk to you. And I, yeah, I thank you. And and I guess I, I I should say it's great to talk to you. But I always feel a little depressed after we finish our conversation. But I will get over it, and we will do it again. Right. 
Well, you know, that's why we exist. So that, uh, you know, when, when the depression sets in, we're the pill to make you feel better. That's <laughs> I, I always knew you were a pill, but here's living proof. <laughs> Thank you, Attila Zares, who, um, who could be a pill. <laughs> we'll see you next time. Aloha.